Okay, what I was saying is, uh, is uh, hello everybody and welcome to our webinar, uh, jointly hosted by Sakia and the South African Society of Cinematographers. Uh, we've got some interesting topics that we're going to discuss, uh, some great cinematographers that we're going to be engaging with. And, uh, and as a starting point, I'd like to just invite the panelists to introduce themselves um, and, uh, and, and uh, Peter, why don't, why don't you start? If you could kick off, just introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about who you are, what work you've been involved in in the past, uh, and perhaps some of the awards that you've won over the years. I, I have a funny feeling that you even have some old NTVA Avanti awards uh, collecting dust on your shelf. <laughs> so maybe we could start there. Okay, so I'm Peter Lamberti. Um, I started as a wildlife um, cameraman um, in, in 1990, and yeah. um, I never studied film or anything. I, I did uh, wildlife photography as a hobby, and um, my, my passion grew from there. Uh, I just changed my uh, cameras. I did my wildlife photography as a hobby while I was in the army, so it, so it was kind of like a, a transition of swapping my guns for cameras. And um, I started uh, doing underwater because it was a kind of like a soft area. There were not many cinematographers specializing in underwater. And that resulted in our company being called Aquavision for many years. And uh, we've still got Aquavision. Aquavision is alive and well, but we've kind of like um, opened up a, um, a, 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 a sort of like a, a company that does a lot more. And we've called it Line Mountain Media, which encompasses our own channels and a lot of um, other things that we do over and above production. So um, we, yeah, um, and yeah, I guess uh, to, to cover the awards, we've won quite a lot of awards uh, over the years. I don't know how many, but um, they do go back to the days of the old Avanti Awards. And I've even won two, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, South African Society of Cinematographer Awards, the uh, the Prism. Um, yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, oh, we need we need Uva to help us out on that one, um, or Dwayne. But yes, the, uh, the Visible Spectrum Awards. Yes, Visible Spectrum Awards. Sorry, I'm a little. <laughs> That's, That's fine. exactly the one. Yeah, I've okay. got two of those, <laughs> and I'm very proud of them. <laughs> and as well, you should be. Okay, who's going to go next? Greg. Go, Greg. No. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm um, Greg Nelson. I started at the SABC. Oh, geez, years ago, five years before Nelson Mandela was released. And okay. in those days, uh, it's a long way back, they, um, you know, SABC wasn't covering what they should have been covering. And uh, I was in the news department as a cameraman editor. So I'd, um, there was a lot of filming of uh, environmental stories and I steered, made sure I steered myself in that direction. And um, after, so, you know, so it was driven by a passion that soon after I left in uh, in '95, I I followed the 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 spec route where I started filming one line project with a partner who was uh, the the um, the producer and editor in this in Pretoria, and I was the field producer cameraman. One line documentary led on to another, another, another. So and then and a second spec series we filmed uh, on um animal re wildlife animal um, at a wildlife rehabilitation center and we got a commission there so it all started from there um really and and then i um filmed as a freelance cameraman for a lot of the you know wildlife outlets uh, bbc um and lo local channels not that much because it was only really 50 50 but i worked a lot for for pete for aquavision um so various various outlets and i still continue to do so today um and awards that probably this were the same thing a, a mixture of south african south african awards and 
and I'd, to be honest, also, you know, also production awards with the whole, it's really, you know, not just an individual thing, but it's also um, you know, kind of a, a team award as well. But I, I still carry on and I'll carry on going until I, until I become blind, I think. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And, and Rion, uh, uh, another award-winning cinematographer that I think has worked quite closely with Peter as well. Yeah, so uh, my name's Rion Fenter. Um, so I started um, only, well, so filming was always a passion for me. You know, growing up, uh, wherever there was a, a holiday or whatever, I would grab the camera and started filming the family. You know, that kind of, that was always, so the, the camera was always a part of what I wanted to do. Um, and not necessarily wildlife, to be honest, to start with. Um, but what happened was, um, through through working in the industry on local television and stuff when i was um, straight out of school um i also didn't do any training um i just started working in the industry um basically i made a very good contact with a cameraman who's now a well-known um he's in the afrikaans uh, film film industry and feature film industry a guy called paul kruger yeah. and he and he, at that specific time, uh, when I was filming with him as his assistant, um, he owned one of the biggest freshwater aquariums in Southern Africa in Hard to Be a Sport Dam. And just at that moment, Peter Lamberti had sold a Greatest Rivers of Africa um, series. And um, so literally, I just hopped from Paul Kruger working for him and became Peter Lamberti's assistant. And I okay. think, um, and that was where, that was basically for me, that was where it all started. Um, the passion grew for wildlife and the, the you know, the, just the, 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 the one to be out there in the bush and film, film the, all, this, all these kind of dramatic scenes and um, awesome things that people pay huge amounts of money to go and, and witness, but I get paid to go and do it. I mean, it's just like, it's one of probably the best, the best career choices that you could take if filming and if wildlife is what you want of course because don't get me wrong there's everyone's told you that i mean in every field of course there's there's amazing positives but there's also negatives i mean filming out in the wild you are secluded you away from family and friends your, your commitments are different but i mean you just can't beat it and if that if you can if you can get to a point where you can say that this is a passion this is what i want to do and all the rest it doesn't matter i think you, you you're in the right track and you need to you need to carry on doing what you're doing and basically that's where i think all of us are and all of us have been um yeah so i've also worked on a, a main mainly freelancing um i left peter after 11 years of service did a i think i'd worked on about 40 films when i left um aquavision so aquavision in those days was was really a powerhouse with regards to um, production um, on in wildlife documentary filmmaking. Um, so I got to use the best equipment. I got to use the have the best experiences. I mean, really, there's there's not not many, not many places that uh, you get that kind of training and that kind of uh, freedom as a as a youngster. So we're all quite fortunate to have Peter um, on our team at that in that stage. Um, yeah, and basically when I left. Um, I, I started freelancing right from the word go through the contacts I'd made, um, carried on working and yeah, I've never looked back. I, I'm still on shoot right now. I'm, I'm looking forward to getting home. I've been in the Kalahari for four months. So, uh, yeah, um, it's going to be, I've literally got a calendar and I'm counting the days. <laughs> Very good. So look, I, I know that there are a couple of other wildlife and underwater cinematographers uh, that are watching this. I can see Gordon's online. Uh, Gordon Hiles down in Cape Town. Um, I want to say to all of the people that are viewing this webinar, if you have any questions, uh, please just post them in the um, in the chat line, and uh, and I'll try to engage with uh, with our audience and ensure that your questions are presented. Everybody should be able to see them. Um, one of the things I wanted to kick off with, uh, I was I was watching, um, I was having a conversation recently with Derek Jubeir. Um, and uh, Derek, of course, one of the, the granddaddies of wildlife filmmaking in Africa. And, and he was talking about the 
role and responsibilities that go with being a wildlife cinematographer. And specifically, he was talking about the fact that it's, um, it's, a, it's a craft that goes beyond uh, simply pointing a camera at a subject and capturing an image. He was talking about the responsibility of uh, wildlife cinematographers in particular uh, to, to educate their market and to create an environment in which we promote uh, an ethos of, of uh, conservation. So uh, I'm hoping that one of you could pick up on that and perhaps we can have a conversation about this ethos. Uh, what is it about wildlife cinematography in particular that imposes that responsibility on each of you? Uh, I don't know, any one of the three of you could pick that up. Okay, yeah, so well, I mean, I mean I'll, I'll, for, yeah, okay. Peter will probably be the best to to start start the conversation. Go for it. So, Peter, no, sorry, Rian, man. Um, look, I think uh, everybody that works with wildlife has got a responsibility to look after it. So it's not just wildlife filmmakers and wildlife cameramen. You know what we do is we bring um, wildlife to to people. So I think we do have a responsibility to to kind of um, present, present wildlife in a way where we let the viewer understand um, you know, kind of like their vulnerabilities and, 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 to, and to be a, a conservationist. Now, I mean, when I entered the industry, I can remember pitching lots of films that had a good conservation message in them. And every time I got chopped down, and um, because they people don't want to be lectured on, okay. on the topic of conservation. So what we do is we subtly build in um, into our movies. There's a couple of things. There's, there's the conservation angle and there's the science. Nobody wants a science heavy uh, film. Uh, uh, what, what we kind of like expected to produce are little wildlife dramas. So what you do within your wildlife drama, you build your science into the story and you build your conservation into the story. So it all becomes part of your story. The, the viewer receives it without really knowing it. What you're doing is you, you are instilling in them an appreciation for the, for the wild and wild places and the animals, and you kind of like setting up their vulnerability. And when people appreciate something and they understand what's there, they are more likely to protect it. So that's kind of where we come from, um, you know, when it comes to conservation. Outside of our films, you know, we, we give talks and we um, uh, do little web blogs and stuff like that there where we can punt conservation. And I'm busy with the children's series now with my kids where we're building a lot more um, conservation into the, um, into the stories. So, so there's lots of ways to do it. But, um, you know, when you're a wildlife filmmaker and, you, and you're filming, it's everybody drums into your head. It's about story, story, story. So what you do is you build it into your story. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So I think. Who, who was... Yeah. Uh, yeah. Now just to follow on from what Pete was saying, I mean, I, I, you know, the the I think the responsibility of that role, of course, I mean, as a as a filmmaker, as a cameraman, um, certainly you you know you you're very much part of that. But I think it, it actually it seems to fall fall on the lap of the broadcaster, the person, the commissioner, the well the people making actually panning out who 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 giving them money for these programs. I remember maybe I've lost everybody. Is that just me? Uh, can you hear me, Kevin? I can hear you, Hello? yes. Okay. Yep. So yeah, I remember so so say fifteen years ago, I was in Bristol. I, I was uh, David Attenborough was giving a talk and he was asked that very question about, you know, how what he feels about the, the whole the role of conservation in the movies that he makes, and doesn't he feel guilty that there is not a stronger message in the programs that they make? And because the programs then were very much just, there was there was no um, people weren't criticizing anything or saying anything, and uh, and he said, look, it's just if you can bring it to people's bed to their to their rooms to their lounges you you know you're making just it's creating awareness but th that seems to have changed now so you know now people are the broadcasters i mean that it seems in these programs and the very programs he's making they're making statements and 
you know, strong statements and saying so and really showing that, you know, trying to get a strong, strong conservation message out. So, um, you know, I, it's, uh, I suppose, I suppose if you're in the game of of uh, actually um, selling selling an idea and selling programs, which you know Pete would be more more into, you know, um, I think um, those are the people where it sits more squarely on. You know, very nice. I um I lost I lost you there, and I'm back back um, uh, reconnected. Okay, sorry about that. So so um. So the question that we were we were exploring revolved around the responsibility of of wildlife filmmakers to embrace a commitment mm. to um, to conservation. Um, I, I know. Okay, so my, other, I mean, have your I've got to ask, uh, How do we put the cameras on? <laughs> I think sending you invitations to do so. Yeah. Um, hmm. There's one now. Sent you a webcam request, Peter, and the same with Greg. And I don't think Rion has a camera built into his um, machine. Now there's oh, it's on my phone. It's a little bit out of date. Yeah, I know. I think it won't let me connect. But um, back onto oh, the on, on that previous that previous question. So um, I've, we've got first-hand experience of this this whole this exact thing. So I work on a show for another um, company down in KZN, which yep. um, which which is called um, which is a snake show, and basically yep. the whole show we started seven years ago when we uh, would uh, would go and remove problem snakes from people's houses and relocate them back into the bush, and uh, Basically, yeah. So it was a snake a snake removal um, show. Now, when we first started that show, um, literally, out of the ten people that would phone us, uh, five of them, or even eight of them, would be contact contacting us with a picture of a dead snake, telling us what snake is this? Um, I found it in my house. It's dead now. And if and uh, it's basically taken us, it took us about four years of this show, and you don't understand the, the effect that the show has had on the snake population down in KZN. It's literally the opposite now. Out of, In fact, we get people saying, phoning us and saying, I just removed the bush snake. I know it's not a green mamba because I watch your show. So this the show, Although people might also have issues and, and say it's not a great show, what it's done for snakes in KZN is absolutely phenomenal. Um, it's literally, it's, it's, it's changed the success of, of snakes down there. It really has. So that's just one little piece of this puzzle where what we do um, to conserve and to get awareness and to get people understanding what what wildlife is and specific wildlife not just broad um, spectrum but really specific um, animals and what they do and where they are and and how to interact with them and what not to do and what to do and so i think i think as a wildlife filmmaker you do play a quite a important role and especially also because a lot of people can't and will never be able to see those animals so you're basically giving people the chance to experience wildlife like like they would never be able to on their own so i mean yeah i really i do think that there is there are benefits and there are definitely other um reasons why you do this do what we do honestly so so now there are lots of film schools that exist in the market at the moment um and uh, i think all three of you said that you did not have any formal training you didn't go to a film school Peter, I think you said that you actually honed your skills in the army. Um, so, yeah. so what advice would you give to youngsters that are, uh, you know, they have this grand ambition to to become a wildlife cinematographer? Would you send them off to film school, and um, or you know, somebody wants to get into this career, how would they do so? Okay, so I mean, do you want me to kick off? Yeah, yeah, please. Look, I mean, we've trained many uh, wildlife cinematographers here at Aquavision and Lion Mountain Media, 
And um, I don't want to diss any film school at all. A lot of our people did come from film school. But I think wildlife cinematography, you know, it needs a certain character. So you do have to have a very good understanding on um, the principles of filmmaking and, and, and photography and all of that. You need a very good background in it. But I think what makes um, an exceptional wildlife cinematographer, and, and I'm talking about this from a, you know, there's one thing having a good eye, but with wildlife, um, it's about catching the behavior. So this is an aspect which is different to any other kind of uh, filmmaking. So you need to have a really good understanding of um, the, your subject, so the wildlife. You need to uh, be able to immerse yourself and kind of think like the animal thinks so that you can position yourself in the right place to capture the drama. Um, you also need to learn to use all of your senses when you're in the bush. You don't just... Um, you know, go around, drive around, shoot, shooting around and uh, looking to see where you can find some animals. You you use all your senses, you know, you, you stop and you listen. You listen for alarm calls, you learn, listen for all the little telltale sa sa um, uh, sounds and things which will help you to find what you're looking for. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, it's also an instinct that you build up over time. You know, do you go left around the bush or right around the bush? And, and you know, Often you got this instinct and you end up going the right way. So there's a lot of uh, things like that which I think can help you. You know, obviously you need everything else that makes a, a, a good cinematographer. You need the eye, you need composition, you need you know all those kind of things. But I think what is what sets wildlife cameramen apart is is kind of like having this understanding of your of your subject and being able to. Uh, find it also understanding how to look after yourself because you know you're working often with very dangerous animals and um, you you have to learn I mean you, you need to understand body language of animals because sometimes you don't want to go close to an animal because it's displaying um, behavior that shows you that he's irritated with your presence so there's all these things that you have to know um, also, you like you don't just drive up to a wild animal. You know, you position yourself and let the animal come to you. When it comes into your space, it's far more likely to um, to accept you rather than you charging into its space and irritating it and getting a reaction that you know is not normal. So there's a lot of aspects which I would sort of like put under bushcraft and um, and know your subject categories which you need to know over and above um, what, what, what is taught in a film school and that's why a lot of our really good guys have also come from like um, um, game ranging backgrounds you know some of our really good cameramen you know were game guides and they've um, and they've done their bagasse and all of that there which has really helped them and that's the advice I often give to young people who want to uh, get into wildlife filmmaking as I say you know go along and you know over and above the camera stuff that you learn go and do your fagasa get to know the animals you know so that you can um, maximize uh, the time that you've got with them and and Greg how does that compare with your experience and, and what advice would you give to youngsters wanting to get involved yeah. in wildlife photography yeah I mean I, I think Picking up what Pete was saying with the, you know, him saying he's he's trained a lot of cinematographers. A lot of them have gone through his company and they've gained practical experience. I mean, they, you know, the theory. I mean, the theory is one thing. I think if you if you're on the level, if you get to the point where someone like Aquavision or another company is going to employ you as, as a, you know, a, 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 a run around or a T boy, whatever, someone who's going to give you that practical experience, you must really be at the position where you've from your own passion you've already got some of your own theoretical knowledge from you know and playing with a stills camera and uh, you know and uh, I mean you don't have to I don't I don't think the colleges that are around these days I personally don't think that you need to go and spend two years there and and uh, spend a lot of money you should you should be able to pick up that experience teachers there's so much information out there on the internet i wouldn't recommend that to anyone i mean i actually i've been through it already with my own children 
Uh, my son now, um, he, you know, I mean, he went through one of these schools, film schools, and okay, I, I can't really, he's he's doing very well now, um, so I can't really say it was bad for him, but I, 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 whatever I could do, I tried to, I stood on my head trying to get him to, I said, listen, don't go that route, I'll try and help you get in, get into do freelance, getting some practical experience on jobs, and then you can hand pick short courses. That there's different outlets will give you very short courses, I and mean, you can hone in on something instead of spending three years. Anyway, that didn't happen, but I would still strongly recommend that to anyone. I would say that um, try and go for uh, for the practical experience over the, the the theoretical three years at one of these places that don't really offer you much practical experience. I don't think it's worth worth the time and the money. That's what I believe. And uh, I think also, you know, just be careful when it comes to wildlife filming. I, I've also been through it with, I've had camera assistants coming out to the bush and working with me where people can romanticize it and, and you know, they don't really realize completely what it's about. So I think if you're not the kind of person that enjoys going out into the wilderness, you know, and hiking in the mountains for, for for a week and sleeping in the open and see if you don't like that i don't know if this job's for you so um I, you know <laughs> you've got to be pretty sure of it so if, as pete says i mean the good guys the guys have done the game guys and game guards i mean they obviously you know that that they have that passion in them already so um i just i i just um yeah i don't know what else i can say but um i just think it's very important to you actually, you've got to realize your passion, basically, you, you know, don't try and just sit there, you don't, you can't pick it up from watching TV and think, oh, that's lovely, I would like to be, you know, a, a wildlife cameraman. You've got to be sure of yourself, understand yourself first. <laughs> there you go. So I want to change the subject here, um, and Rian, maybe I can ask this question of you. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about technology. I remember I, when I first met Peter, he just bought the very first uh, Sony 790, uh, the Digi Beta, um, and it was the kind of the bee's knees for wildlife cinematography. But technology has changed fundamentally uh, over the last kind of three decades, particularly uh, technology relating to, to wildlife cinematography. So I, I'm going to start with Rion, um, but then I'd, I'd like all three of you to talk about how the changes in technology have impacted your craft. Uh, so, Rihanna, are you ready to kick off with that question? Yeah, sure. No, I mean, uh, so, uh, yeah, as you said, I mean, technology is changing. I mean, it, it feels day to day, even though it's only uh, year to year, probably. Um, and the thing with the thing with um, wildlife is there's so much scope for different different kinds of cameras and this and a similar story told in a different way. So basically, almost every single pitch has to change or the camera the, ca the the cameras that you're using or the cameras that you are building uh whether it's a a, a den camera or even building a den or a, a burrow system or getting underground with your subject instead of just filming it above so the technology is literally changing day to day and the demands from the um from the big production houses are it, it's it's really yeah, it's difficult to keep up with actually. So, my my um, what I've what I've done so far is I've only literally recently bought a camera, and up until here, I've actually stayed away from gear apart from buying lenses and tripods because the technology is changing so fast that you actually, unless you are a big production house like a Aquavision or a, you know someone that's really distributing a lot of shows every year, you don't really want to commit to to a, a, a proper camera until you've sold an idea or until you've got work for that camera because within a year that camera is going to be obsolete and the next camera is going to be the new camera and no one wants to use that the one you've got so my my um my the way that i've moved forward is obviously hang back on the on the camera gear rather higher in what you need buy the glass buy the legs Buy all the little bits and pieces, the sliders and all the little gimmicky things that you can keep rolling. 
but uh, until you've got the commission show stick away stay away from the actual camera um, but I'm sure Peter will be able to talk to you about a lot of the things over the years I mean the, the other fantastic thing working for um, Aquavision was there was no holding back on any kind of design. I mean, if you thought about if we were doing sardine run or if we were doing something, you know, a terrestrial based show and we came up with this idea to do something, I mean, Peter would say, okay, well, go and build it. There's his workshop. And we would literally on the ground be making this new camera that we could tow behind the, I mean, nowadays everyone's towing cameras, but back when we did it, we were like, pioneering all this stuff i mean it was really really awesome so so peter will be able to talk to you about all the latest technologies whether it's infrared whether it's night vision um yeah you know, all sorts of things and obviously drones have taken over and made life a little bit a little bit easier for a lot of us filmmakers too uh greg do you want to do you want to jump in there i don't want peter to always go first um, uh, okay. well, I think, I think, yeah. how is how important? Well, I mean, I think, look, just adding to, I mean, uh, Brian's right in the things he says, it's a, it's a challenge. Uh, technology is important, it's more important to the broadcast, you know, less to us. We're just continually following the broadcast's demand. So, you know, that's the, diff that's the challenge. So it's very, very difficult as a private operator to, to invest in gear because, you know, you can buy something now and then, the next minute, um, you know, the, the, the broadcaster changes, he wants a higher spec, a higher spec, you know. Um, yeah. And so that's difficult. But I don't think as a as a young upstart, you know, when, when you, if you're keen and you, 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 you know, and you're beginning, um, the early stage of getting into wildlife filmmaking, I think you can use it to the, the, the higher standards of domestic cameras now, which we never had in the older days. I think you can use to your advantage don't be put off by broadcast specs. I mean, I think a lot is a lot now has got to do with um, content. I mean, you can, you know, go out and you you've got to you you know you've got to stick your neck out. You've got to do stuff in your own time on spec and not expect to get paid for it. And um, you know, especially if you onto something, especially if you onto something that. Excuse me, sorry guys, just hold on there. Especially if you onto some onto something unique. Um, it's it's more it's that thing becomes about the content and uh, you know someone someone will pick it up and now now the art is so much you can do with that you can, you can go on the uh, on the internet and so but we do get locked into oh hell I don't want to film that because it's not going to be you know the highest bit rate and it's not 6k and it's not this and that so you, you don't bother but I think as a young filmmaker you shouldn't let that put you off someone's going to recognize your you know your hard your input and you know and, and, and recognize a really good program that you maybe put together on something hell on a cell phone camera you mean uh, you know and, and you've edited on your laptop people will people will recognize um something out of that and and peter if you can just jump in uh, maybe you can talk okay, about some so of the new <clears throat> come in as well yeah, look, um, <clears throat> technology is just exploding right now. And I mean, you can even get 12K cameras. Uh, and you, as Rian was saying, you've got drones and we've got thermal cameras and we've got infrared cameras and we've got cameras that are almost over the shelf, um, uh, cameras that can film at 400,000 ASA. So the, the tools have never been better. But I, I just want to sort of hit this sort of, 4K, 8K, 12K thing on the head a little bit because everybody kind of thinks and they're chasing these 4K and, and we're doing it too. And, and it's because um, you, you're kind of forced to. But I'll tell you that 80% of the people we supply films to don't want it in 4K. They still want it only in HD. Yeah. Um, I, I think that 4K is, a, is an overkill for broadcast. I think even your 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 4K TVs and that they, they they are still only now getting to resolve HD. So I think HD is still alive and well. Um, like Nat Geo, if you pitch to them, they will say, "Oh, if you make it in 4K, we'll take it in 4K." But our requirement is HD. So um, 
you know, you know, I, I think people don't have to worry too much about that. What's more important is uh, what, what these 4K cameras can offer is the dynamic range and, um, you know, what you can do with the color. Um, there's and also the, the high uh, frame rates that you can do now. So, you know, I think that's that's more of interest um, than, than actually the, the you know, I mean, there, there are people who want you to shoot in 8K, 8K and stuff like that there, but, um, you know, I think it's because it gives you the possibility to zoom in and you, and you can actually get your sort of uh, medium and close-up shots in one shot, you know. Um, so there, there's a, there is advantage to it, but I think, um, you know, as far as uh, 4K going on, on um, television screens, I don't think... Uh, that they're ever going to be able to produce a screen that's going to show the uh, true 4K um, quality. But anyway, um, the... Can I just interrupt you? What you're saying is that the 4K creates more opportunity for you to, to, uh, to, to develop imagery in post rather than in camera. I beg your pardon? I, I, I think what you were saying is that the 4K cameras necessarily give you a better image. They allow you to create more opportunities in post rather than in yeah. camera. Yeah. Look, they're great, but they've got their hang-ups. You know, with um, with the with the big uh, sensor, you're obviously limited with your um, depth of field and that there, and also you're dim limited on your length, the length of your zoom cameras. So um, you you know you've got those limitations and when you've got the wild dog chasing an impala straight towards camera to keep it in focus now with the big sensors is a lot more difficult uh, so um so, so yeah so it's got its drawbacks too but um you know i think you, you, with wildlife filming the stock footage has always got such a value that you want to stay with the latest technology because you want that stock footage to be able to use be used way into the future yes I saw Greg sticking his tongue out sideways. Is that because you have an opinion there, no. Greg, or is that because you're you're? No no. Uh... <laughs> no, no, no. I was not pulling my tongue at you, Peter, at all. <laughs> no. no, no. I agree with what absolutely. I agree completely with what you say. I mean, the the it, it actually that that as a as a as a freelancer doing things on spec, you know, the for, the format is is a. Uh, it's still it's still a problem and um, it's still a challenge. I mean, but I, I wish I could believe what Pete says that about HD and you know um, and that I could bring myself to just using my my HD camera. But I I've, I have been through it before. We have done, I filmed the whole project on spec and I've spent over a year filming it on HD. Um, well, actually, sorry, this was going back SD. So. And I filmed the whole thing on SD, and then HD came out. And the commissioner it was about to be commissioned, and then they had a um, that commissioner left, uh, and the new one came in, and bang, sorry, no, we we're not taking SD anymore. It has to be HD. So maybe I'm still burnt from that. So <laughs> you know, it, it's just people. But there was there was, a, there was a marked difference between SD and HD there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But I mean, is it not the case now with 4K? People still want delivery on 4K. So you know, if you shoot the whole thing on HD, they want 80% of it has to be delivered on 4K. Otherwise, they're not interested. Greg, we are deliver we delivering six shows for Nat Geo now, all HD, nothing in 4K. I'm ke I'm keeping 4K masters here, but Nat Geo don't want them in HD. Really? I don't want yeah. them in 4K. They are taking HD delivery. But is that so? Yeah, that's Natio. Um, content. Sorry. I, I said, it, in essence, what Peter's doing is future proofing the value of his content. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, where I can, I, I will produce in 4K and I'll just keep the masters because, you know, I, I don't do commissions, I do co pros. So, I, I, I eventually get all the shows back. So yeah, I am future-proofing them by shooting them in 4K. Yeah. Yeah. 
I mean, I think everyone's doing that nowadays. Even the sh even the shoot I'm working on now, I know it's a HD delivery, but we're shooting 4K. Okay, yeah. so um, so so in terms of technology, technology is important, but actually the story is more important. The imagery and the graphics that you create. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that saying "content is king" is very very true. I mean, we, we made 18 hours of that series called Caught in the Act, where some of the footage was even cell phone footage, but it was all about the content. So they, they never worried about the, the quality, all about, it was all about the behavior that was captured on the camera. Can I just so, say, oh, yeah, sorry, just to, just to, to give you to, uh, an example of that. I, I shot that, uh, everyone knows Stoffel the Honey Badger. And the BBC made a program about um, a, a full feature about the honey badger, and they every single bit of that honey badger escaping from its enclosure um, was footage that I'd shot on SD, because when they went there, the honey badger had become um, too dangerous to actually let escape, because w the moment he got out because they would throw a rake or a box in for him to escape and film it, but then someone would have to go and catch him. And the, that was the problem because he would escape and the first thing he would do was run after his potential captor and just and attack him. So it was too dangerous. They stopped doing that. BBC arrived there at war. They had nothing to film. So all of my footage was on, on, on SD. And still to this day, only last year I've still um, I sold some SD footage. I keep selling that footage over and over, and that's still sitting on on SD uh, on the shelf. Anyway, but so, so, so content, content. Now I want to pick up on this because you've you've just spoken about being attacked by a honey badger. Uh, you know, I've watched some of Peter's footage where he's swimming with great white sharks. You know, I I shiver when I watch this. I, you know, actually I think he's putting himself in mortal danger, and I, but I have exactly the same. I watched some of the stuff that Derek and Beverly Jumeir have, have shot uh, with with lions and elephants. And uh, what was your one of your first movies, Nile River Goddess, Peter, uh, was yeah. about the, the the Nile crocodile. Uh, and there you are swimming around underwater with a crocodile <laughs> that's twice as twice your size. Uh, this is a dangerous profession. So how do you make sure that you, you don't get eaten by, by the subjects you're filming? Okay, so Kevin, this comes back to knowing your subject. So with the great, with, with great whites, uh, okay, you're not allowed to dive with them anymore because they've okay. kind of outlawed it. But back in the day, if we were going to get into the water with the great whites to, outside the cage, we would make sure that the water was crystal clear that you had good visibility, you could see the shark from a long way away. When the shark comes near, you know, keep eye contact with it because the sharks, they, they understand that you can see them. We, we find that the sharks will come up close behind you if you're not looking. So, you know, there's all these little things that you that you learn. So um, we would, yeah, uh, and also keep the camera between you and the shark. You know, if the shark comes up, you bump it on the nose with the camera. Um, so. Yeah, and you always have somebody watching your back. So there's little things that you do. You can also watch the sharks. If the, the sharks are displaying erratic behavior and that, then you get out. So, and also, before you even get in, you watch the sharks for, a, for quite a long time and make sure that they are calm. So there's lots of things with crocodiles. If you're gonna get in the water with crocodiles, make sure the water is cold. If the water is warm, that thing's gonna have steam and gonna be able to bite you. If the temperature of that water is low it's a reptile it can't do much so you know also visibility make sure the visibility is clear um so yeah it's 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 about knowing your animal and and, and um watching the animal's body language because the the animal will let you know if it's um if there's something wrong and and um you know if it's if you're going to irritate it and that can uh, or do something that can provoke an attack and, and greg what, what's the you know if, if i look at, at the films that you've made the kind of uh, you know you work in similar environments to peter so uh, what are some of the scary moments that you've experienced 
Um, oh, I, some some frightening experiences. Well, um, I was filming lions once, and we had to we had to uh, we were calling them in, and they were not responding. Then we heard them starting to roar close by. Well, they must have caught something. Let's see what they caught. And they caught a person, and they were eating it, eating the person. And um, that was tough to see, and we had to chase the lions off the guy. So that wasn't. I mean, that was quite horrific to see. But it, uh, I had a, I had a, a a sound man get knocked over. An elephant brushed past me, went for the sound man, and smacked him on his feet. On it went down on on over him. Tried to put try to tusk, put a tusk through his leg. Um, I, I've had you know, a few other incidents, and uh, and I must say, um, if, if the if I can give any advice to someone, I can say don't don't just don't just do what Pete says and understand the behaviour of the animal. Um, it's natural behaviour. Also, also try and try and just be be aware of where you're filming, and just try and establish whether there has been any kind of habituation towards humans by that animal because the wilder the animal the less dangerous it is if there's any kind of habituation or association with people and it's you know there, there's any that sort of interference the animal becomes much more dangerous and unpredictable because it's not then behaving completely naturally and normally Rion anything you can add to this hi sorry you broke up there um so yeah my my um so when I first started filming, basically um, my I was um, straight out of school. I did my open water one because um, I'd managed to land a job with Peter, um, and literally, and that was in December. And in January, I was diving with Peter at uh, Pinnacles in Mozambique, uh, surrounded by four Zambezi sharks circling me like they wanted to eat me. So. You know, I would say as a wildlife filmmaker, the you've got to you've got to be prepared to um, be put in out of the comfort zone. That does happen a fair amount of time. I mean, you've got to trust your instincts. And secondly, um, a, a very valuable lesson that I that I learned, and I and I think all film all guys that are filming in the wild in the wilds all have all attached themselves to a specialist in the field, and especially where they're filming. So in other words, if you are filming great white sharks, you know, Peter and I or whoever is filming wouldn't just rock up, get a boat and go and dive with great white sharks. We would attach ourselves to a professional, to a scientist, to someone that's really um, understands and, has been, and that's their specific field of expertise. And, and I think the, that is definitely something that needs to be done. You, you can't. You still need to attach yourself to someone um, that knows that specific animal more than you. And then the second, the the, the lesson that I learned was uh, a, a tiger shark show that I did with a guy called Mark Addison. Um, that Peter, uh, it was a, a an Aquavision show. It was called Dive to Tiger Central. And I still remember looking overboard, and I'd never dived with tiger sharks before. And Mark Addison was the expert. He'd been doing this for years and years and years. He was the guy that we were diving with. He, you know, we were there. He was supervising the whole shoot. And I looked over and saw five tiger sharks, three meters, three and a half meters, swimming below the water right behind me, where I'm now going to throw my body into the ocean. And I looked up at, at Mark and I said to him, Mark, are you sure this is okay? And he said to me, Bud, I promise you, nothing's going to happen. You've got to trust me. I know these animals. And, and ever since that, that's been my philosophy. If you're there with a scientist and they say you can do it and they say this is not a problem and it's all good, you've got to trust your guts, obviously, but then you've got to do it. You've got to commit and you've got to film. And, uh, and so far, so good. I mean, there's obviously been one or two moments where we've been chased out of swamps by hippos and all that's left is a... Uh, a pair of uh, boots and a pair of socks and no one to be seen because you run so fast. But um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, you just got to follow your guts. You've got to trust your instincts and you've got to follow and, and, and listen to the experts in the field um, of where you're filming. I think you've got to, you, you, you can never be so 
blase and, and think you know everything, you've got to um, listen to those the specialists in the areas. So, so here's a question I wanted to pose. Um, I have a perception that filming wildlife and, and making wildlife programs is significantly different to making feature films or documentaries uh, or television studio or television productions. Uh, I, again, I, in a conversation I had with Peter a couple of years ago, I remember him saying to me, you know, when you're shooting in a television studio or a soundstage, uh, you always have a power plug available. When you're out in the bush, uh, these things are not necessarily available to you. So if I had to say to each of you, what's the major difference between working in wildlife and working in any other genre of filmmaking? Uh, and Peter, perhaps we can start with you. Okay, it's very easy. It's called scripted and non-scripted. <laughs> okay. Most things are scripted and you know what you're going to shoot. With wildlife, you go out there and you shoot what you can. So you can be lucky and you can get your full story in a few weeks, or you can be at it for years and uh, you know before you get your full story. You know, um, if you're making a film about leopards, you might not find your subject for a couple of days. You know, um, so yeah, with wildlife filmmaking, there's, um, you know, what even though it's it's um, the harder you try, the luckier you get. There's still luck involved. Um, so, yeah, and I think it comes down to that scripted and unscripted. You know, not uh, when you're working with something that's not scripted, you kind of in the hands of what uh, the animals allow you to film and what they what they choose to do. Right. Yeah. If, yeah, if you, I can just. Can, if I sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Carry on. Carry on. Perfect, great. No, I was just gonna just just kind of um, add on to what Peter's saying. I, I absolutely 100% couldn't agree with more. I would just call it, I would just say, you, it's called maximizing the moment. That's it. You, you're, given, you're given one chance, you, you could spend two days trying to see that animal and you get one fleeting glimpse of it and you've got to make sure that you've that had given the best possible options, possibilities, opportunities to catching just that one three second shot and that's it. Then then that's satisfying. As opposed to, you know, okay, here we go, take number thirty. I mean, what the hell? Don't compare it. Yeah, no, I'm I'm on exactly you got the same I mean you got one it's a one take wonder. So you miss your opportunity, that's your your shot done because the chances of a lion taking out a giraffe and that's what you're supposed to get doesn't happen all the time so if it happens you better make sure that you've got the camera ready and you are ready to to shoot it as best you can because there's yeah there really is generally only one opportunity to get something amazing sure I, in fact uh, the other example that uh, i remember i discussed with peter a few years ago uh he, he said to me that when you're shooting in a sound stage or a studio uh, you know, you can control the environment, but often in a wildlife documentary, you're shooting over an extended period of time, and the seasons change and the lighting changes, um, and that actually yeah. impacts the way you tell the story and, and shoot the documentary. I uh, don't know if you want to yeah, add anything to 100%. that. 100%. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, that's 100%. Yeah. We start, so the, even this film that I'm working on now, we started in winter, where the sun was up at seven o'clock and down at you know five o'clock and now it's up at five o'clock and down 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 a hell of a lot earlier and later. So yeah, times change, um, the animal's behaviour changes. So but that become that that almost is incorporated in your storyline. So your story your story changes and your story moves and moulds and that's the beauty about wildlife filmmaking is that your subject actually dictates your storyline. Um, which is great. So it literally keeps you on your toes from the first day of shooting till the last day, and and you, your 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 show has to move, and has to adapt, and has to, um, yeah, it takes on a, where you where you start in the beginning. You could go in a completely different. I mean, obviously this the main storyline will stay the same, but your your subplots and your other little storylines could change. I mean, your your main character could die. Um, and then that's going to become part of your story and your and a different uh, outcome. So yeah, definitely um, 
wildlife filmmaking keeps you on your toes for sure. Very nice. So look, we're down to our last couple of minutes. Uh, if I had to ask each of you to give me your input, if you were giving some advice to a youngster that was interested in uh, pursuing a, a career in in wildlife filmmaking, uh, what would you what would you deliver as your elevator pitch to this young fella? Uh, let's start with Greg because he's perhaps already rehearsed this on his own son. Ah, 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 okay. Well, perhaps just maybe a summary of what I've said earlier is that um, you know, look, I think just just. You know, you've obviously got that passion, but I would just say, you know, you, you've got to be, you've got to be prepared to stick your neck up. Take a, take a chance. You've got to, you've, you've got to um, go out there and, and put the time in and make your own little movie. Make your own little movie on something in your own garden. Put up a bird feeder, get something, whatever, whatever it is that interests you. Get that malachite sunbird coming in and doing one, and then it builds a nest. Actually. Just pick your subject, put the time in, use whatever you can get your hands on, but just don't let people put you off. You can't do this. Just, just, you've got to just be positive and uh, use whatever resources you've got. It doesn't matter if it's your cell phone. But, um, yeah, just, um, and and uh, from the point of view that it's practical, that's all practical experience. And the the theory, just get onto the internet and uh, and learn. I I wouldn't waste your money on on these uh, organisations, these companies that are out there that offer these three year film degrees. Forget it. Just be your own teacher, and then people from there on, people will pick you up. I can promise you. And Peter, how how, how would you respond to that? What advice would you give to to any youngsters? Bearing in mind that your own kids are now film stars. <laughs> okay, so I'm just going to sort of bring up a saying that I heard from one of South Africa's most famous wildlife filmmakers ever, Michael Rosenberg. And he had a saying, is he says, how to make a small fortune in wildlife filmmaking is to start with one. Uh, start with a large one. <laughs> Michael Rosenberg. His dad owned a big uh, steel works and he sold, they sold out to Barlow, so he inherited a fortune and he blew everything making films. And I think this is something that you've got to be really careful with because wildlife filmmaking, it's, it's, it's so wonderful and there's so many beautiful things that you can do, but it's, it sucks up money. So you've got to manage your money very well. And, you know, I've also um, built my business on a, on, on a thing where I've tried to avoid doing um, commissions. Commissions, you get more money. Okay, uh, I, I've done co-productions where, where you get less money but you own the product afterwards. So we're finding now during COVID, we are repurposing old films and um, putting them out as new films because they've run their license and they and they and they're free and clear. So it it gives us a second tier of 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 making money. And um, you know we've got this big library of fifteen thousand hours of stock footage. It, it allows us to always complement every movie that we make. So, it, it, but it, but I have to tell you that it's feast or famine. You know, you 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 you, you develop a lot and you sell 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 like crazy, and then you ha have kind of like the perfect storm where you get a lot of business and you make a lot of movies and you actually make some decent money. But while you've been busy, <laughs> you haven't been developing. So then you go into a period where it's really quiet and all that money that you made gets burnt up uh, you know in while you're in the doldrums so it's it really takes from if you if you want to run a company it really takes a lot of very careful management and also um you yeah because there's um there's no guarantee of, of a constant flow of work so yeah and i mean i've learned my lesson the hard way you know, believing the work's going to come in, come in and keeping a large complement of staff and, and um, <laughs> yeah, getting burnt. So, so yeah, I think wildlife filmmaking, well, cinematography is different because um, I, I think it's a, it's a game where people are very well paid now. Um, they, yeah, 
but it's like anything, you know, it's one job to the next. So you've got to, um, yeah, you've got to just put yourself out there. And and I, if I had to give anybody any advice, I'd say, you know, try and have something else you can keep yourself busy with when when, when you hit those quiet times. Yes. Like brew beer or something and sell it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I would imagine hard on families as well, because you're out in the bush. Uh, or out at sea filming uh, and away from your family uh, for uh, for extended periods of time. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's that's uh, one of the hard things as well. So, so Rion, uh, from from your perspective. Yeah, I would just. Yeah, I mean, I would just say everything that both um, Peter and Greg have said is absolutely hundred percent. But um, you, yeah, I mean, this is a passion. This is a, a passion career, and if you don't have the passion go somewhere else because you've seriously got to have such passion for this pro for this for this career it can be so rewarding it can be absolutely amazing but you've you yeah as i said right in the beginning of my first comment there's sacrifices that you will have to make it's not all glory it's not all fame it's not driving the best car it's not having the best house it's purely being just satisfied with yourself and satisfied with who you are and what you're doing so it's really about passion and where you want to be and what you want to do um yeah and, and it's not for everybody i can tell you right now lots of people i mean I, i've i've experienced so many guys that come through the ranks and work their way up and now they got a coffee shop and or they're selling cars or you know they <laughs> change their change their mind quite quickly so it's not everybody's cup of tea but if it is something that you can um, that you can master and get involved in and really become um, good at it it's phenomenal and you can't beat it I mean the experiences that I've managed to do are bucket list things you know where where people would pay huge amounts of money and I get paid to go and experience these amazing things and and yeah I can't um, I can't complain it's been it's been an awesome 21 years that I've been filming now, and it's yeah, I'm looking forward to the rest. Sounds great. I'm going to wrap it up. Thank you very much to all three of you for joining us. And um, yeah, I, I truly, I appreciate you sharing your knowledge, your skill, your experience, your expertise. Uh, yeah, well done. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kevin. Okay. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks, Greg, Thank Rian. Yeah, thanks, to Pete and Rian. All the best, man. Cool. Oh, sorry, guys, I've lost you all there. Eh? Uh, it's here, you, Rian. Well, enjoy, Rian. Enjoy the rest of the shoot. Cool. I think Kevin's. Oh, sorry, the uh, I think Kevin's. Kalahari Wi Fi has given up here. Uh, okay, Kevin's I think gone. it's over. Hey, I think Kevin's called it. Yeah, he's called it, yeah. I thought it was going on till half past three, but that's good. I'm going to hit the road. All right, cool, guys. All right, guys. Cheers, good seeing you. Have Cheers. a good shoot, Cheers. Greg. No, thanks, Cheers, mate. Cheers, man. Cheers, guys. Thank you. Bye. Cheers, Pete. Bye. Go well, eh? Enjoy. Bye.